time for another edition of the Silver Bullets Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Michael Citro. And I'm Chip Minnick. Chip, uh, we thought that, you know, Indiana might prove to be a good test for the Ohio State University Buckeyes. Uh, the is not trademark, or trademark uh, pending anymore. Uh, but that was not the case because Ohio State really had no problem at all with the Hoosiers winning 51-10, I believe the final score was, if memory serves. You are correct. <laughs> so I'm going to start out this week by just asking you, are you, I think we both expected a comfortable win, but there's different levels of comfortable. Uh, are you surprised by, I guess, the ease with which uh, Ohio State was able to go to Bloomington and uh, push Indiana around on both sides of the ball? Not really, simply because last week, if you recall, when we were talking about when we were revisiting the Cincinnati win and how that was kind of a surprise, the fact that Cincinnati came in and we both thought that Cincinnati was going to give Ohio State uh, you know, a more competitive game than that turned out to be. And when we were previewing Indiana, kind of the assumption was, all right, well, Cincinnati and Indiana are comparable in, in terms of talent. Maybe not necessarily. I, I, like I, I'm, I'm not going to say that there are you know players from um, that on uh, Cincinnati that couldn't start for Indiana or vice versa. But I think they were just overall their talent base was comparable. So mm-hmm. I think when when looking at it, I mean, I I truly thought okay as a result of, of how dominant Ohio State was against Cincinnati, I felt very comfortable even though it was on the road and I thought it was a good test. I thought Ohio State would be able to handle Indiana easily, and they did. Okay, well, you and I uh, both predicted a win uh, against Indiana, and uh, your prediction of the score was much closer than mine. You were 42-10, to 10, and uh, that was uh, 51-10, to 10, so you were nine points off. I predicted 40-23. to 23. I thought that Indiana would get some garbage time scores, and they did not. Uh, so uh, you win this week. Okay. So you don't win anything. You just get to say that you won. <laughs> I know. I so know. Good, so good job. Uh, the game really started out, uh, I mean, right off the bat, it didn't look like Ohio State was too bothered with Indiana, but Ohio State was not sharp in the passing game. Uh, Justin Fields was just a little bit off to start this game, a little bit inaccurate, maybe a little hyped up for his first road game. Things were just either a tad high or a tad out in front of a receiver it was not really off by a lot, but it was off by just enough to throw things out of sync. And even though uh, J.K. Dobbins came out of the gates uh, running well and the, the offensive line was doing a good job, uh, Ohio State got a little bit um, maybe aggressive at times early in the game with uh, trying to call some pass plays and, and not quite connecting on some of those balls. So uh, it, it was a little bit of a slow start. The first quarter was only 7-3. Justin Fields with a three-yard touchdown run. Uh, I believe that was just uh, moments after J.K. Dobbins had dropped a pass that would have been a sure touchdown. Uh, and then um, Indiana came back at the end of the half with a decent drive and, and put up a field goal, 7-3 at the end of one. And I'm glad that you brought up how Justin Fields was a little high on, on a tad high on his passes because uh, for the Ozone.net, when we were asked to give out Buckeye leaves and peeves, I even said that this is a minor peeve, but I'm certainly hoping that that Ryan Day and the Ohio State offensive coaching staff work with Justin Fields. The fact that some of those passes were sailing, it didn't turn out to hurt Ohio State. There were no interceptions, but those are the kind of things that against a a better defensive opponent in the future could wind up being a turnover for Ohio State. So I certainly hope mechanically they work with Justin Fields on as you said, maybe he was a little overhyped. Maybe it's something with his with his with his stride or with his release or something. But, but I certainly hope that they work on that because you would hate to see those kind of high, uh, sailing high passes turn into turnovers. Absolutely, but I, I think that this was a good um, it was a good learning experience for Justin Fields. His, his first road start, you know, maybe conditions weren't quite the same you know being on the road the surface a little bit different there's some things that he's going to learn and I think he learned I, I do think that he adjusted in game pretty well for the most part and 
corrected himself. He certainly looked like uh, his old self when he hit Chris Olave with a 37-yard touchdown pass to make it 14-3. Yeah, and I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, Chris Olave, he's he's certainly establishing himself as kind of a jack of all trades uh, for the Ohio State, uh, you know, offensive offensive and special teams units. I mean, we'll get to that later on, but. Uh, you know, Olave and and Justin Fields certainly are demonstrating uh, some some chemistry and cohesiveness in the passing game. Yeah, we're going to stay with Chris Olave because uh, that that touchdown came uh, with 11:26 remaining in the second quarter, and a minute and 11 seconds later, Chris Olave decided he really liked having the ball, and so he went after the ball in the punter's hands and uh, knocked it back into the end zone where it went out for a safety and uh, it was quickly Chris Olave had uh, scored twice as many points as Indiana had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it certainly, I mean, it just kind of makes me wonder based on uh, Chris Olave's performance, uh, you know, as a special teams guy, uh, you know, the fact that he blocked a punt last year against that team up north the fact that he did it against indiana you know that he's been uh, uh very very uh instrumental in terms of a, as a special teams gunner and and pinning the opponents down deep it makes you wonder if um ohio state simply lacked somebody of chris olave's speed because i mean chris uh, terry mclaurin was a very reliable gunner but he was never the punt blocking threat that Chris Olave has demonstrated in his still very young Ohio State career. Chip, was Urban Meyer holding back these special teams? I certainly hope not. <laughs> um, you know, for a guy who you know kind of gained a reputation for being a special teams master, uh, so far the you know his his ace pupil is kind of showing him up a little bit, in the, at least in the early part of the 2019 season. Yeah, so uh, the the Buckeyes led 16-3 after the safety. They got a stop. K.J. Hill then uh, scored from nine yards out on a pass from Justin Fields, make it 23-3. Uh, and then J.K. Dobbins ripped off a, tw- a, a really uh, masterful, uh, and I'm, I'm not really meaning any pun there when because we're going to be talking about Master Teague, but uh, a, just an incredible 26-yard run where he would not be denied the end zone and made it 30-3. to uh, with 4:09 to play, so Ohio State went from seven to three at the end of the first quarter, out to a quick 30 to three lead in the second quarter. And that's kind of when you think about it, uh, you know, considering how Ohio State started out against uh, Florida Atlantic in, in Game One, and they kind of they kind of took the, the foot off the gas. Um, you know, it was it was very nice to see that okay, Indiana was kind of battling them as, as well as they could in the first quarter, but then Ohio State really took it to them in the second quarter. Yeah, I really think that Ohio State had uh, some self-inflicted problems early, but uh, you know, at, once they settled in and started to roll, it was uh, Indiana was clearly no match for them. It, it's worth mentioning that Indiana, uh, you know, we didn't know if Michael Penix would be able to play. It turned out he was not. Peyton Ramsey played, and I saw so many people talk about how great Peyton Ramsey had played against Ohio State a year ago, and he did. But you you also have to remember that he played against a really historically bad Ohio State defense last year, and I didn't have a lot of the same fears or concerns with Peyton Ramsey playing uh, that a lot of people did on social media, It seemed, or at least they seemed to. Uh, and a lot of people were talking about before the game how they were concerned about Indiana hanging around because lately those games have been, you know, they've been kind of a thorn in Ohio state's side. And I, and I just go back to something that I believe we said on the show, three straight years, Indiana wasn't within three touchdowns of Ohio state. So you're going back to 2015. If you're saying in recent years, Indiana has played Ohio state close. So if 2015 is in recent years, then I guess you can say that. But for me, three straight years of really restoring the dominance over Indiana didn't really have me concerned about this. uh, And I was definitely not concerned about uh, Peyton Ramsey in this game. Well, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. You know, like you gotta, (laughs) you gotta kind of build up the the hype and the suspense of, Oh, okay. Well, Indiana gives Ohio state a a tough game every time they play. Yeah. You know, it's like, all right. Yeah. If, if every year is, is 2015, but I mean, that's, four seasons ago 
Mm-hmm. So, in, and one of the things that we haven't really talked about in great detail yet is Ohio State's defense, I mean, is, is just, it's truly, I mean, I mean, it's such a stark contrast from where they were not just last year, but even you could make the argument two years ago. Uh, just the, the the I think not only the scheme but just the overall attitude that the uh, the defense as well as the backups are displaying at least through the first part of the 2019 season. Mm-hmm. I think Indiana had negative yards like two or three drives to start the game. Couldn't run the ball at all, and then uh, Indiana made some nice adjustments where they were getting the ball out of Ramsey's hand quickly and and trying to hit you know tight ends and receivers in the seams of that zone. And I think that they were able to just just by changing things up like that. I think that they were able to move the ball, and of course they got that field goal drive. And then late in the first half, they got a a big play on a trick play. And this is something that I talked about uh, early in the game. It seemed like no one was talking about how these passes out in the flat seemed to be going backwards. They were all laterals. I think if any of them had hit the ground, they were fair game, but they were caught by the, the Indiana receivers. And I, and I said online, I said, this is uh, this to me looks like they're setting something up for later. And they released that Kraken in the, uh, at the end of the second quarter with a, uh, you know, a lateral to uh, Donovan Hale, Donovan Hale sent it downfield to Peyton Hendershot who had, nobody anywhere near him and he was behind everyone and they took advantage of that aggressive Ohio State defense with that trick play but that Chip that to me is a trick play you have to see coming if you're the defensive coaches and you have to tell your team to be ready for that I agree with you and I also think uh, it kind of spoke volumes about the personnel that was on the field for Ohio State at the time Uh, I'm not suggesting that Baron Browning would have caught uh uh, what uh, Peyton Hendershot, um, but I just saw on on uh, the the screen that you know tough Borland was chasing in vain, uh, trying to catch up to him, and and he's not going to he's not going to win in that race, no matter if if they start even. So if anything, that should as you said, the the coaching staff has has to do some soul searching here about what kind of schemes and opportunities they're going to put. Uh, tough Borland in because you don't want to make him, you know, put him in a position where you're asking him to cover and he's unable to do it. Yeah, and and again, there's there's no safety back there behind everybody like there should be. So, you know, I'm just saying I'm a all I'm saying, look, Chip, is I'm a guy on the couch sitting there watching the game, and <laughs> and I can see this coming. I'm I'm not the defensive coordinator. I would assume somebody that gets paid quite a bit of money to dissect what the offense is trying to do to your defense would have come to at least a similar conclusion if not the exact same conclusion that this is going to at some point go the other direction it's going to be thrown out there and it's going to be thrown again or there's going to be some kind of gadget off of this that they need to be ready for now for all I know they noticed it the first time and immediately told everybody to watch for it and maybe they just didn't watch for it but um, you know maybe they didn't read their keys correctly or whatever but uh, it, it certainly seemed like a preventable uh, trick play because it was, I mean, they, they ran that two or three times and it just, you don't run a play that doesn't work that many times unless you're going to do something off of that play at some point. I not only agree with you, but I also, also I'm going to kind of find the positive in that entire situation. And that is now that Ohio state has seen it, as you said, multiple times in the one time that they, resulted in a touchdown that now the defense having seen something like that that they'll be better prepared for it going forward and on the other positive side of that is at least Ohio State I mean the worst uh, case scenario is that they gave up a touchdown when they were already up uh, 30 to 3 so now they were up 30 to 10 so it didn't come back to bite them uh, uh, as it could possibly down the road if they don't learn from this mistake. Mm Mm-hmm. So a, a defense has been really good at not giving up explosive plays. Gave up one right before the half, and it made it thirty to ten. And so I'm going to talk about something that really has been a, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine through three games. And that is, you, if you're getting the ball back with more than a minute to play, and you've got at least one timeout in your pocket, you've got a young quarterback. You want to see what he can do. 
you're going to at some point this season need a two-minute offense, a two-minute drill. I get that you don't want them to make a mistake and then have Indiana get closer, but it's th- it, you got a 20-point lead. Why not run the two-minute drill, see if your quarterback can do it, see if your offensive line can do it, and if it if it works, awesome, you got more points, and if it doesn't work, you know there's something else you need to work on. I agree with you, and I think something else to kind of think about is that I would rather do it when I have that comfortable lead versus when and I am behind and or I need to do it and you know we're talking you know you're on the road in a hostile environment and maybe this is for the win you know what I'm saying I would rather mm-hmm. kind of get the get those two minute offense jitters or growing pains if you will out of out of the way or at least addressed uh, while I'm comfortably ahead so I think you have a valid point there yeah, and, and it also it's set up to be perfect for that opportunity because on the first play of the drive, J.K. Dobbins rips off a 15-yard uh, run. So he's he's already gotten you some breathing room, you know, after a, a poor decision by Demario McCall to bring out the the kickoff. If he takes that touchback there, it's at the 25, and then that 15-yarder run gets you out to the 40. But uh, he got them some breathing room, and then they hurried to the line as if, hey, they're going to go for it. And then they ran the ball again, and it didn't didn't uh, only netted a couple of yards. And then they tried a play action max protect, which isn't fooling anybody with less than a minute to play. You're not fooling anybody with a max protect, only sending one or two guys out into the pattern. Um, they're not going to fall for that. Yeah, I mean, like you said, kind of puzzling, and I know it's been irritating for you at least through the first three games. So let's hope that maybe uh, Gerd or Tom will ask Coach Day what's going on with the lack of a two-minute offense when they get the opportunity to do so to, uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, and and I, I did listen to their post-game show, and they had mentioned that maybe that's something they would uh, address with Ryan Day and just ask him, you know, what's the criteria for, for trying to, you know, and, and, you know, who knows if Ryan Day will answer that question truthfully or at all, but uh, it would probably be good to, to get some uh, perspective from the head coach on on what his thought process is in terms of uh, a two-minute offense. I agree. All right. Seems like I'm catching you getting a drink here here and there. I'll try not to do that anymore. <laughs> uh, no, no, it wasn't. That that was I, I had just swallowed it. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So. Oh, no problem. So uh, 30 to 10 is your halftime score, Chip, and it's uh, it's feeling pretty good. Ohio State's going to get the ball back to start the second half. And it doesn't take long for the Buckeyes to score uh, another touchdown in the third quarter. Uh, J.K. Dobbins on a four-yard pass from Fields. Really good job for Justin Fields to stick that in there. And a, and a nice catch in traffic by J.K. Dobbins to cap off a, a drive uh, that went 97 yards in nine plays. Uh, it took uh, three minutes. Oh, sorry, I'm, this, I'm looking at the wrong line. This one took 75 yards in seven plays. It took 245. Yeah, I mean, they they certainly did not take their foot off the gas coming out after halftime, that which was again a welcome sight to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, two more scores before the end of the quarter. Uh, Master Teague went for <laughs> forty yards, and that capped the nine play ninety seven yard drive. And uh, Master Teague uh, was your pick to click, and boy did he ever click! I mean. J.K. Dobbins could have easily, I mean, easily in the early in the third quarter had a career high in yards, but they they didn't need him to have any more yards, so they put Master Teague in, and Master Teague uh, went for, uh, well, he went for a lot of yards. Yeah, yeah, he uh, won. I'm I, I'm glad that that Ryan Day is, even though J.K. Dobbins, as you said, had a career day and was was. I mean, it's, it's nice to see that he earned co-offensive uh, player of the week uh, for the Big Ten uh, on his exploits against Indiana. But getting back to Master T, this is why you want, when you have that big lead, you want to develop uh, your your backups. You know, and I know we'll talk about them in, in greater detail uh, as we as we progress the review of, of Indiana. Is it? It does you no good to wear down J.K. Dobbins or possibly get him injured in a 
game you already have comfortably won. Not that I want to see Master T get injured either. I mean, that's not what I'm trying to imply. But I'm just saying it sometimes it sometimes seems as though coaches lose sight of you know the fact that it's a it's a long season and and this team just like almost every other team in, that that plays college football has big goals and aspirations and by continuing to rack up yards and points when you already have the game and one to me is it, it just kind of you lose sight of you know you know like the importance of developing your backups in the event of an injury or in the event that J.K. Dobbins was tired. So it's nice to see Master Teague certainly responded when given the opportunity against Indiana. Yeah, Master Teague went for 106 yards. Uh, I believe J.K. Dobbins was nine yards shy of his career high, and he, like I said, he easily could have had a new career high had there been any interest in, in you know setting any personal marks for him because uh, he only would have probably needed one or two more carries to get it the way he was running. And uh, Teague had a big day. Uh, you know, he had a 40-yard run. J.K. had a 56-yard run and a 26-yard touchdown. So you got to see more um, explosion plays in the run game, which is uh, always a welcome sight after, you know, last season they were so few and far between. And uh, it was it was just a, a good day for the offensive line, uh, knocking people back, open up holes. Not just the offensive line, but the the receivers were blocking well. The uh, you know the other you know the the couple times you would see um, Justin Fields need to run, you would see the, the 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 running backs pitching in. So it was a good team effort from a rushing perspective. And uh, Teague's touchdown at that point made it forty four to ten, and. Uh, then the scoring was capped. No scoring in the fourth quarter this week, Chip. The scoring was capped at the end of the third quarter by uh, uh, Damon Arnett uh, going 96 yards the other way with an interception. And, you know, you and I probably are among the few that remember the Damon's is the place for ribs commercials that were ubiquitous in Columbus back in the day. And uh, Damon's is apparently the place for picks. Oh gosh, get the hook. Anyway, yeah, Damon, uh, Damon, no, in all seriousness, yeah, uh, Damon Arnett, it, I mean, he certainly has been the favorite whipping boy target. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess you could say fairly uh, over the last few years. I mean, it, uh, out of maybe tough Moreland, uh, might pipe up and say, hey, you know, hold my beer kind of a thing uh, in terms of being a. You know, under under assault from Ohio State fans, but Pete Werner. Um, it was nice to see Damon Arnett. Oh uh, yeah, Werner. Yeah, there's another guy. Uh, um, but I really do think that it was nice to see Damon Arnett play as well as he did against Indiana to have not only that interception, but that that lengthy uh, interception return for a touchdown that was immortalized by Gus Johnson with you know his his play by play as it as it happened. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was nice to see that. It's uh, it there could have been a lot of turnovers in this game. Of course, the the blocked punt is essentially a turnover, but it doesn't really go down as that. It was uh, there were a couple of drops by Josh Proctor. There was another drop uh, of an interception by Brendan White that would have been nullified any anyway by a penalty on Cam Brown. So um, you know the 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 defense has to do a little bit better with holding on to the ball when they get opportunities because against a good team, they're going to punish you for missing those opportunities. And, um, you know, they had another fumble that they didn't get on, but the, a lot of that is just the luck of where the ball bounces and when they recognize it's out and who sees it first a lot of times. And um, it seemed like the law of averages was starting to turn in Ohio State's favor late in the Cincinnati game, but, uh, but it seems to have, have spurned the Buckeyes again and is going the other way with those bounces. But, uh Overall, a big day for the Buckeyes. They doubled up Indiana on first downs, 30 to 15. Uh, they rushed for 306. They passed for 214. Not a great day passing, but um, got the job done. No interceptions, which is always a, a good thing. Uh, Indiana ran for 42 yards and 215 uh, passing yards. So uh, complete domination. 520 total yards for Ohio State in, uh, on offense and 257 for Indiana. And I think that Indiana is a team that's probably capable of putting up 300 yards on most of the teams they play, but they were not able to do that against the Buckeyes. And I want to give you know credit to you because, I mean, you're 
your picks to click were Chris Olave and Chase Young. And I mean, we, uh, um, we all witnessed Chase Young's dominance on Saturday and so far this season. But Chris Olave, we mentioned him earlier. Uh, you know, he had, um, I'm, three receptions for 70 yards if Mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken Uh, you know so he he averaged a little over 23 yards a game he had the touchdown he had the punt block so both of your uh, picks to click you know they both came up I I had Master Teague as you referenced earlier Baron Browning I I I saw him in the game but I don't recall him making any you know truly instrumental plays um, like he had shown in the first two I'm certainly not writing him off Mm -hmm. but yeah I want to definitely give you a lot of credit for uh, the Chris Olave and Chase Young uh, picks the click. Well, let me first say that there is uh, almost zero risk in picking Chase Young as a pick to click. That's true. That is true. <laughs> you're, you're not going to get a lot of, uh, of, of doubters when you make him your pick to click. Uh, Chase Young uh, made two solo tackles, one assist, so only three total tackles. But two of them were sacks. He had two and a half of his three tackles were tackles for loss. So uh, Chase Young didn't need to do a whole lot in that game, but uh, you know before getting some time off. But he was he was effective, and you know so he put up some stats in just a, a few tackles, and and he affected things just with his presence. Um, I would say that he clicked, and I would also say that uh, both of our offensive picks, uh, Olave and uh, T, clicked quite well, but there weren't too many that didn't click. What was surprising to me is on a day that Justin Fields wasn't quite uh, as good as we've seen him in the past, that a receiver actually was in the picks to click and and was able to live up to that. I think that uh, Olave had a a big day. Benjamin Victor had more catches. He had four, but only 66 yards, did not find the end zone. Uh, Good spread, though, for the Buckeye receivers. Uh, Victor had four for 66, Olave three for 70. Austin Mack, 2 for 27. K.J. Hill, 2 for 23. J.K. Dobbins caught 2 for 14. And, of course, he had that drop touchdown. Garrett Wilson with a pair of catches for 8 yards. And Jalen Gill, 2 for 6, although he did fumble one of his catches. So, uh, young man's going to have to work on his ball security. Um, the, you know, you, you, you picked, obviously, Master Teague, who was a tremendous pick to click. I mean... Uh, as good as Dobbins was, uh, Master Teague was just as good, just didn't have as many opportunities. And you picked Baron Browning, and I don't think we could say that he clicked. He had uh, two total tackles, one solo, one assist, and no other statistics, no passes defense, no tackles for losses, no sacks. Uh, so uh, I would say that Baron Browning did not click. But I think a lot of that was scheme, the fact that he's... he's um, He's played well, but he's he's really sharing a position, so it makes it really difficult to get uh, to build some stats. I would agree with that, and a guy that uh, what was I think very impressive. Uh, you you referenced Chase Young having the two sacks. I believe uh, Javante Jean Baptiste had his, was credited with a sack. Tyler Friday was credited with a sack. But the, where I wanted to say what was very impressive was Zach Harrison. Uh, planting uh, Peyton Ramsey like a tulip in the in the field at Memorial Stadium mm-hmm. um, late in the game when he came around the edge that was very impressive to see uh, you know because as hyped as he was as a recruit and how instrumental it was for Ryan Day to secure him being the top player in the state of Ohio I think a lot of people just kind of presume oh okay well he's going to be just like the Bosa's and Chase Young and come in and be super dominant. And almost anyone that had seen Zach Harrison play in high school would, would tell you the athletic talent is there, but he's extremely raw. Mm-hmm. And getting the opportunity to play against a team like Indiana and get uh, you know get some some much needed uh, repetition against a decent opponent is certainly going to go a long way in his development. So I mean, Zach Harrison certainly. It was very, very impressive from what I saw on set. Yeah, he, I mean, he's he's really got some good speed. The I'm going to give Peyton Ramsey some credit, uh, Chip, because he, he probably just in athletic ability, strength, and intelligence avoided five sacks in that game. I mean, he was in the grasp of, I, I know Chase Young missed a sack oh, easily. on him. 
Uh, he, he, had, he was in the grasp at least four or five times and got away and was able to either scramble for a yard or two or throw the ball away. So he, I mean, Ohio State's sack numbers, they, they have five sacks for 30 yards total, and that easily could have been doubled. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I think most people, when it, when it was announced, what was it, Wednesday? I'm trying to remember what day it was last week when it was announced that Michael Penix was not was going to be like a game time decision. Um, I think you know I think Peyton Ramsey certainly acquitted himself very well against a, a very talented Ohio State defense. Yeah, I, I'm I was impressed with his athleticism. I, I don't remember being that impressed with his athleticism last year, but he, I mean he was he he broke some tackles in the backfield and, and at least kept uh, kept the team from from losing. And he, and he also held on to the ball a few times when. I really didn't expect that ball to st- still be in his hand when he hit the, the turf because he was hit hard a few times. Uh, so a good job by the defense. Oh, just yeah. Ca- Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say like that aforementioned that aforementioned Zach Harrison sack. You mm-hmm. know, like that certainly would have. I certainly anticipated a fumble out of that. So give credit to Tate and Ramsey for holding on. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, we've done our picks to clicks. We talked about uh, talked about our. Um, our score predictions, and, and you were you were much closer than I was. Uh, any other thoughts that anything else that stood out to you during the game? Uh, I will mention a few things that I saw that I you know I mean one is I don't think that we can say that Ohio State is comfortable with their field goal kicking uh, situation. Blake Hobbill missed a 32 yarder. Uh, another thing that stood out to me was getting to play. Uh, Chris Chuganov again, some plays on the road. We got Gunnar Hoke in there, and he was able to complete a pass. Uh, so it's, it's it's more playing time for them. And also we saw uh, Demario McCall and Marcus Crowley only get a couple of uh, carries each. Master Teague ended up with uh, with ten carries in this game. So um, the final thing I want to touch on is Justin Fields. That stood out to me is they're not running Justin Fields. They don't have to, and they won't have to this week against Miami. Um, but it, it just makes me wonder when are they going to fully weaponize Justin Fields at, at at some point this season? Well, I, I think kind of to that point when they when they deem it necessary. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of why show your cards when uh, you know just kind of have the opponents that you have not yet faced kind of secretly wondering what else do they have up their sleeve with this guy uh you know because as you said you know they haven't really truly weaponized justin fields yet but i have every every confidence they're going to eventually so um i think indiana you know just kind of one last comment about indiana is that um this loss to ohio state was not unexpected and if anything i think i'm going to be anxious to see how indiana bounces back after the video footage surfaced of Indiana head coach Tom Allen, you know, so being so um, emotionally motivating in the room, you know, equating the game against Ohio State to the to the uh, historical Buster Douglas knockout of Mike Tyson, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you know, trying to ex- exhort his team onto victory, and you know, and and. You know, as we said, you know, after the first quarter, it was seven to three, and Indiana was was trying to hang tough. And I agree with you when you said some of the, you know, Ohio State with the the field goal miss and some self inflicted wounds that it didn't necessarily have to be that close. But Indiana was, you know, kind of convincing themselves they were in that game. Now this coming weekend, just looking at Indiana's schedule, they've got Connecticut, so that should be a win. So now you're looking at three and one. But I think you and I both agreed when we were looking at Indiana's schedule that the pivotal game for them is going to be October 19th at Maryland. That will be kind of the determination as to whether or not they can be within striking distance of that that six-win threshold to get themselves to a bowl. We'll see. But I think Indiana's pretty, you know, pretty competitive for a Big Ten team. They just happen to run into a, a, an emerging juggernaut within the Big Ten East Division. Yeah, one thing I will say is that you probably if you're going to if you're going to David and Goliath your team and try to fire him up, don't invoke a guy from Columbus as your underdog. 
Yeah, I, I don't think that was truly well thought out. <laughs> I, I uh, think, you know, I think he kind of thought, okay, you know, these kids know about Buster Douglas, you know, and, and how he shocked the world and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but I don't think he, he realized, okay, yeah, I'm talking about a guy from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I Like I said, I'm, I'm more curious to see how, you know, after you – you pour so much of your heart and soul into something, uh, how you bounce back, you know, like that, you know, they, they truly, and that, you know, they, they truly thought, Hey, we're giving these guys a game. And then it just started to snowball and, and got away from them. And as I said, I, I wasn't surprised with the outcome. I, I just wondered deep down inside if Tom Allen and, and his coaches and players feel the same way. Uh, but how they, how they, move forward after you know being walloped by you know 40 points in um in a game that they had really hyped up i'm going to be kind of anxious to see how they respond well we saw how cincinnati responded they went out and struggled with miami for a while before pulling away uh, and winning 35 13 so cincinnati kind of was in that same boat in terms of you know hyping up that game and and making it a focal point and then uh, they lost by 42 points and then they kind of got off to a slow start, very sluggish against Miami before winning that game. So uh, Indiana may uh, want to get things cranked up a little earlier this week uh, than my than uh, Cincinnati did on Saturday. I also believe that Indiana is playing. Um, let's just say that UConn is not really, you know, a top notch opponent. I think they'll I think they'll bounce back fine. Um, right. It'll be. I'll be more. I'll be more curious to see how they do as, as they get out of their non-conference schedule mm-hmm. and get into some more Big Ten uh, opponents. You know, I think the week after the week after they play UConn, I think they play Michigan State. So that should be interesting to see. You know, because everything I've seen, everything I, I saw from from Indiana shows me that they can be competitive. I just don't know if they can take that next step you know when it comes to um being able to go against the teams that might have more talent um but we'll see you know michigan state uh rutgers i mean those those teams are certainly the kind of games that indiana needs to win that would you know get them to like i said that's six six win threshold for a bowl well, I uh, I think they're probably wishing they had Sparty at home based on what the Spartans did against Arizona State uh, this weekend, although that was in East Lansing. But, it, you know, the Spartans did not acquit themselves well against the uh, Sun Devils. No, they did not. I mean, that was – that was – I'm sure Jim Trussell was watching it. Um, I don't want to say with a big smile, but enjoying just the the kind of stoic – uh, stodgy nature of um, Michigan State, you know, kind of like the, you know, they, they defensively were, were stout most of the game uh, until the, the tail end when Arizona State scored the go-ahead touchdown. Mm-hmm. And and I know Mark D'Antonio afterwards was complaining about the officiating, but the offense that Michigan State was running it was such a strong contributor to the Spartans losing at home. And I I know the fans don't want to hear that, but, uh, you know, we kind of all look at each other wondering, okay, what's the rationale here behind a ill-performing offense and not getting rid of some of the assistants, you know, just kind of, as they say, you know, reshuffling the the, de- the, the chairs on the on the Titanic mm-hmm. mentality that Mark D'Antonio had offensively. It certainly came back to bias Arizona State. Yeah, it wasn't good for the Spartans, and their fans have to be a little worried about their team going into this season. We talked about, you know, in our Big Ten Eastern Eastern Division um, preview, you and I kind of talked about how, you know, we weren't sure that the Spartans were really back yet and, and that we had a lot of question marks about them. I think this proves that we were right to have those questions, and, you know, they definitely don't look like they've reached the the – Penn State or Michigan level just yet. I, I think they might be able to surprise some teams with their defense and and uh, steal a game here or there maybe against a, a better opponent, but 
I don't think that they look as good as they should look, especially uh, considering they were getting Brian Lewerke back. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. If anything, that game against Michigan State at night, I'm certainly feeling better than I did um, a couple weeks ago based on what I saw um, from Ohio State against Indiana and what I saw from Michigan State against Arizona State because I do think Michigan State defensively, they're, they're just always going to be very tough. It's not going to be easy to score points on. But at, having seen Ohio State's defense and, and Michigan State's offense, I'm feeling much more comfortable uh, – even with the, the sordid pass that uh, that Ohio State fans have when it comes to Michigan State and night games in Ohio Stadium. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, let's look around the Big Ten a little bit. Uh, it was a, uh, a a rivalry game for Penn State, and, and I, I flipped over the game as soon as Ohio State was over. I flipped over to watch Penn State and Pitt, and I watched Pitt just absolutely uh, – I just, I don't know, act like they never played football before, I guess is one way to put it, because they were given every opportunity to tie the game in the fourth quarter with not much time left, and their play calling from inside the two-yard line was just, it it seemed like they let somebody's, you know, seven-year-old call the plays, I guess, and then the decision from the one-and-a-half-yard line to kick a field goal when you were having trouble moving the ball and there you were at the one-and-a-half-yard line, it's indefensible, even though Pat Narduzzi defended that decision by saying they needed two scores to win. Yes, but you need to get even with the team that you're playing to even get into position to win. So, yes, you need two scores at some point, but are, are you more or less likely to get the touchdown the second time than you are to get it from the one-and-a-half-yard line? I, I just think everything about that game pit screwed up and, and had every opportunity to steal one in Happy Valley. And when we talk about Pat Narduzzi, let's not forget that he used to be one of Mark Antonio's most trusted, if not the most trusted lieutenant uh, during his time uh, in East Lansing. So maybe he kind of got some phobia or illness associated to being productive on offense that he has taken with him to pit. I don't know. But, uh, if anything, it did show that Penn State probably is not as good as, you know, the fact that, that they uh, were able to kind of be dominant in their early games, um, but then they ran into a, a better defensive team in Pittsburgh. All right, so we, uh, oh, sorry about that, we had a little bit of a technical glitch, but I have Chip back on the line, and chip the so the Penn State Nittany Lions didn't look all that impressive against Pittsburgh but it is a rivalry game and and, you know they were up for that game so I'm not sure I can read too much into it but I certainly expected Penn State to score more points and and I I certainly think that Pittsburgh uh, had opportunities to do something in that game and and to to really put the pressure on Penn State at home and just failed to do it I I recall the the sequence uh, of the the first and goal situation, I think it was second or third down where the quarterback faked the handoff to the running back and took it outside and lost a yard when if he would have just handed the ball off, it would have been a touchdown. So uh, just a a bungled possession, a bungled decision to go for the field goal. And then on top of that, you missed the field goal from 19 yards out. Yeah, I kind of what I was saying before we had the technical issues, I think you know, Pitt's going to look back on this game, and they're going to—they're going to lament, regardless of what Pat Narduzzi tried to, how he tried to spin it, that you know how he made the right decision. They're going to lament this game, knowing that that game was was theirs for the taking. And as for Penn State, I think if anything, it showed kind of what I was ex- I was suspecting this year that I think Penn State the talent is there, but they're young, a lot of crucial positions and I think we'll see how well they do as they get further and further into Big Ten play. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a disappointing uh, weekend for the Big Ten overall as a whole if you look at some of the stuff was going on. The Maryland Terrapins had scored 79 points and then 63 points had only given up 20 points in two weeks and they lose giving up 20 and only scoring 17 at Temple on Saturday a a uh, big shock and welcome back to earth for the Terrapins. Maybe Maryland was starting to 
read and believe too much much of their press clippings. Maybe you know, kind of. Oh, okay, we're back. Um, and and by the time that they realized, hey, we're actually in a game against these guys. That oh, by the way, they beat us last year too. Um, and we're we're not playing well on the road. Um, I think they I think they kind of a little a little too late. Um, but kind of what I was I, I just believe that Maryland I think that they are certainly improving but I think they've got a ways to go before they can truly claim to be back uh, as a bull contender so Maryland has a week off to think about what they did <laughs> and uh, you know to 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 wallow in their in their mediocrity from that temple game and then they get Penn State at home so who are we going to find out more about in that game, Maryland or Penn State? I'm going to say we're going to find out more about Maryland um, because the game's at home. It is on a Friday night, uh, much to my everlasting dis- disapproval. <laughs> um, and I'm looking at you, Jim Delaney. Uh, but um, I think we're going to, you know, be- because Maryland, they came out. You know, and they were dominant in their first two games. They laid an egg in this last one. The game's at home. I think this is more of a, a measuring stick for Maryland to kind of truly see how they stack up against the Big Ten East. Now, that, I'm not trying to absolve Penn State uh, by any stretch. I think that they did not play well against Pitt. But I think the fact that the game's at Maryland, I think that's going to kind of give us a better idea as to how much further Maryland has to go to truly measure up against the elite of the Big Ten East. Mm-hmm. Of course, Michigan Chip had the weekend off to uh, think about how fortunate the Wolverines were to escape with uh, an overtime, a double overtime win over Army, uh, an Army team that missed a field goal in the final play of regulation. Uh, and they will go to Wisconsin, and uh, that will not be an easy matchup for Jim Harbaugh's Wolverines, especially the way that Wisconsin has performed this year uh, to start the season. The, uh, the Badgers, of course, uh, absolutely demolished South Florida and um, <clears throat> then absolutely demolished Central Michigan. The Badgers, Chip, have not allowed a point this season. And that, to me, is if, if there are warning signs, signals, bells, whatever kind of things to kind of get the attention of Jim Harbaugh is the fact that this Wisconsin defense, as you said, they haven't been scored upon yet. Now, granted, this is meant with no disrespect to South Florida, and you, I, I believe it was Central Michigan. Is Central that correct? Michigan. Yeah, Chip, it's okay. You can disrespect those schools. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but I, I do believe if I'm if I'm going to look at this game. Uh, I think the the game plan for Wisconsin is, I mean, to completely stack the box based on the anemic passing game that Michigan has displayed so far in the first two games of the season. And I think that's how I think Wisconsin is going to win this game. Um, I can't recall. I'm not sure. I'm not much of a gambling man. I I thought I saw something with the, the betting line that Wisconsin was favored maybe by three. But I, I think Wisconsin's going to be win this game very, very comfortably. And I think, if anything, you're going to start to hear a lot of anger and frustration from the fans of that team up north because this is supposedly – this was supposed to be the Wolverines' year and it's looked like anything but during the early part of the 2019 season. Mm-hmm. Chip Rutgers uh, had the weekend off, so they did not have to suffer any embarrassing losses this week. But their opponent this coming weekend certainly had an embarrassing loss in in you know in Boston College. So um, if I was if I was Chris Ash, I'd be a little concerned about what kind of team they're going to be facing when they play against Boston College. Uh, let's move on to the western side of the bracket. Nebraska bounced back from the loss at Colorado with a win over the uh, over Northern Illinois, and that was a 44-8 victory. Not a challenge for the Huskers. Uh, Huskers are back, Chip. We'll see. Um, I'm. I fell into that trap once. You know, <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna keep stepping in it repeatedly. I. I think um, they're pointed in the right direction. Per, but let's just see, kind of, as the season progresses, especially 
when Ohio State comes to town on September 28th, how well Scott Frost has Nebraska positioned to win the Big Ten West. Mm -hmm. Between this week and that week, uh, Nebraska will face Illinois. Illinois is coming off a 34-31 home loss to Eastern Michigan. Illini are back, Chip. (laughs) Yeah, in the cellar. Uh, (laughs) You know, I think it's fair to say that the Lovey Smith experiment has truly not panned out. And uh, I, I, I am sure that uh, Lovey Smith is doing everything he possibly can. He was committed to the youth movement, you know, playing as many young players kind of with the idea that, you know, by this time the team would be much more competitive. And the fact that they're losing to Eastern Michigan kind of speaks volumes about, you know, just kind of how, how poorly prepared Illinois is for conference play. So I think Nebraska is going to take it to them at home too, Chip. Eastern Michigan at home. Um, right. The Illini chip, they are they are two and one on the season, wins over Akron and Connecticut on the road. Uh, they need four wins to get bowl eligible. Here's their schedule: Nebraska at home, at Minnesota, Michigan at home, Wisconsin at home, at Purdue, Rutgers at home, at Michigan State, at Iowa, Northwestern at home. Where are those four wins coming from, Chip? They ain't. <laughs> they I ain't mean, happening. I mean, even Rutgers will probably give them a game. I don't see them winning any of the other games. No, I. That's why. That's what I'm saying. It's like that's a that's a coin flip between you know depending on what the fate of Chris Ash at Rutgers and Lovey Smith at Illinois in terms of you know which which athletic department has decided to throw in the towel and. Let's start all over again. Uh, yeah, Illinois is in, in for a very another very long season. The fact that they lost at home to Eastern Michigan should kind of, again, give some kind of indication as to what the status of that program is. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for a positive for the Illini, uh, they are scoring points, 42 in week one, 31 each of the last two weeks. So they're, they have somewhat of an offense. You're really looking then. <laughs> you're 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 truly finding that you're, you're truly finding that diamond in the rough because, um, yeah, they're, I mean they're scoring points, but look at the the opponents that they've played, mm-hmm. the one that they just lost to, and as you just you know think honestly and objectively as you possibly can about who they have yet to play. So yeah, we'll see if the points are still coming as the opposition improves as they get into Big Ten play. Yeah, it's not looking good for the Fighting Lovies. And uh, there's no Illibuck game this year. I have heard, I, I can't confirm this, that the Illibuck Trophy has uh, sent an email to the University of Illinois saying, yeah, I'm good where I'm at. I'm sure. I have no doubt. I'm just going to live here. There's just no even, not even a point. Permanent uh, residence. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's see what else uh, happened around the league. We have uh, we have to talk about uh, the game, affectionately known as El Asico, <laughs> the Iowa at Iowa State game with the Hawkeyes holding on for an eighteen seventeen win. The Hawkeyes had to punt late in that game, but Iowa State, in true Iowa State fashion, muffed the punt and uh, thus muffed a chance to win the game. That, I mean, what a horrible way to lose. Uh, I mean, Iowa State, they are certainly, you know, when you talk about Matt Campbell, there's a guy who is doing everything he can with limited resources talent-wise to make Iowa State competitive. And the fact that they, they lost in such heartbreaking fashion should not negate the fact that, I mean, they gave Iowa a game, you know, for, you know, like throughout most of that contest. So, um I think Iowa, that you know, as it gets closer and closer to it, I think that Iowa Wisconsin game is going to be something else to see. Mm-hmm. Northwestern was off; they will play Michigan State at home on the twenty-first, and uh, Minnesota Chip uh, went uh, or didn't go anywhere. They played Georgia Southern at home, and good for the Gophers; they win thirty-five, thirty-two, a whole three-point victory over Georgia Southern. Now, that was a game that I certainly did not anticipate being as close. I, I truly thought Minnesota playing against 
an option team would have been able to shut down Georgia State offensively. The mere fact that that Minnesota is undefeated is completely negating the fact that they've won every one of their games in very close fashion so far this this season. So kind of what we're just talking about, I think, is as the opponents get better and better for Minnesota, let's see how they do. I think the 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 mighty uh, PJ Fleck experiment might start to kind of go sour. Um, you know, like there's only so much rah rah that I think a person can take, and if you're not seeing the results on the field, I think those fans in Minnesota are going to get kind of a little uneasy about having PJ Fleck at the helm. Are they going to row the boat in West Lafayette this week? They might row him out somewhere next week. Actually, um, they they got a bye week. They get, they they get till the 28th to go to Purdue. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, an eight point or a seven, I'm sorry, a seven point win for Minnesota against South Dakota State at home. Then they go to Fresno State and win 38 35, and then they win 35 32. So seven points, three points, three points. Minnesota likes those close games, and uh, they're learning how to win the close ones. I guess well, that's the, great. <laughs> that's great. But let's see how they do against better opponents mm-hmm. because when you live that. When you live on the edge dangerously, I mean, that usually kind of, I, I'm sure you would agree, that usually comes back to bite you, and we'll we'll see if that starts to happen to Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Purdue Boilermakers, Chip, are off to a 1-2 and two start. They have lost at Nevada on a long last-second field goal, and they lost at TCU uh, 34-13. That vaunted Purdue offense not getting it done against uh, number 25 uh, TCU this week and uh, so that Vanderbilt win in between doesn't look all that uh, doesn't look all that impressive no it doesn't um, I may be mistaken but I think Purdue was without their starting quarterback against TCU so that certainly could have played a contributing factor but mm-hmm, yeah Purdue correct. has to, yeah Purdue has to they have to get back uh, you know to playing um, much better as as they get into conference play because I mean, in that in that division, and I think like one of their Big Ten East crossover games is against Penn State. I mean, they certainly have very little uh, margin for error, you know, considering the fact that that they're already one and two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's really, uh, I mean, they're they're probably still capable of getting to a bowl, but they really gotta they gotta tighten things up and and it. it yeah, the, it, it sucks when you don't have your starting quarterback, uh, but I, I still think that, you know, this is an offensive coach you would expect to, to be able to get something out of his backups more than 13 points. Yeah, I would agree with you. Especially when you have Rondale Moore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it, it just kind of, they, they've got to figure out what it is that is working and what isn't and and try and get that get that turned around you know, before the end of September. Mm -hmm. Have we talked about the entire conference? I feel like we have. Yeah, I think pretty much. I mean, you know, like we, you know, obviously we were talking about Ohio state, Indiana, a bunch of the teams had, had buys. Um, It's, it's exciting to know that, you know, we're pretty much now going, you know, with, you know, going full bore into just big 10 football from here on out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, You got the Miami game here and then it's, it's a gauntlet for Iowa State. We've talked about some, you know, four straight difficult opponents. So uh, the you know business is about to pick up, as they say. Yeah. Well, what is not a gauntlet is this this game against Miami of Ohio, um, <laughs> yeah. and I, I mean that with with the fact that um, I was actually in Ohio Stadium back in the last year of the John Cooper years, specifically when Miami of Ohio came. Uh, into Ohio Stadium, and they gave Ohio State, I don't want to say that they ever scared them, but they gave them a decent game. Ohio State won 29-16. to But ever since then, every time Miami comes to town, Ohio State really puts the hammer to them, and I'm certainly anticipating nothing different uh, this coming Saturday when Miami shows up at, for uh, a 3.30 kickoff. Yeah. So you mentioned J.K. Dobbins was the co- Offensive player of the week in the Big Ten. That's a, a good thing, but you know what? The Big Ten, you're a bunch of cowards with the code. 
Just it's a co. Come on with the co. You're cowards. Just say J.K. Dobbins was the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Week, uh, and not somebody that had a lesser opponent, and not somebody uh, that wasn't done early in the third quarter. <laughs> this was this was a domination by Dobby, is what I will say. I yeah, I mean, I don't. I, maybe they're just trying to, you know, that kind of that participation trophy mindset yeah. has creeped into the Big Ten offices. Cowards. All right, uh, let's talk about Miami of Ohio. Now, back in my day, Chip, and and somewhat in your day, they were the Redskins. Yes, they were. They're not that anymore. No, they're not. Uh, they are the Red Hawks, I believe, is now how we're saying this. Yeah, they they had to go through. It's kind of a long story, but the political correctness of um, the name change um, back in the early '90s. So they've been the Red Hawks now for over 20 years. But mm-hmm. yeah, you'll still you'll still hear people refer to them as the Redskins because that that's who they were for most of their history. Yeah, habits die hard. It's it's hard for me to remember the change, even though it's been as you said two decades. Uh, it's not like an opponent that we see every year, uh, so it's uh, it's and I do that all, for a lot of teams that have changed their names over the years. It's like it's just a force of habit, and I'm I'm old, Chip. I, I just got even older on Saturday. Can, so. Yeah, happy birthday! <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it's uh, so Miami, Chip is this should not be a close game. No, it's not going to be. It's not. I mean, you can. Um, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast. I'm not a gambling man uh, just because I don't have money to lose. Um, But uh, this is the kind of game, you know, I think that the betting line, the last I heard was up to 40 points that Ohio State was favored by. Uh, We referenced how Cincinnati, um, they beat Miami last week. I think you said 35 to 13, mm-hmm. you know, and, and a reference point being for Ohio state fans, you're talking, okay, that's the same Cincinnati team. Ohio state shut out 42 to nothing two weeks ago. So um, I am not going to be so bold as to predict a shutout, but I am going to be so bold as to predict um, a lot of, true freshmen and redshirt freshmen and backups, you know, and the sophomores, all those, all of those players are going to get the majority of their playing time. Uh, if they haven't had it yet, it's going to, it's going to come at the hands. Um, I, I should say in opposing the Miami Red Hawks. Mm-hmm. So uh, Miami chip is one and two on the season with a, a couple of very similar losses uh, lost at Iowa in week one, 38-14, and of course lost this most recent weekend, 35-13. So very similar scores uh, against Cincinnati and Iowa, both on the road, which tells me, tells me that Cincinnati uh, should be about uh, ready to contend in the Big Ten West. Uh, yeah. That's one of the first well, things it tells me. And yeah. the win chip came against Tennessee Tech, 48-17 at home in week two that was uh september 7th i want to know from you chip can you name tennessee tech's mascot and are they an fbs or fcs school i know for certain they're an fcs school correct i know for certain that i do know i could not begin to tell you what the tennessee tech mascot is the correct answer is golden eagles Okay, wouldn't have guessed that in a thousand years. Even if you had, if you had started spotting me any kind of bird that flies, I mean oh, anything. We could have done. Uh, we could, I would like to solve the puzzle, Alex, but I can't. There's no yeah. other, not Alex. Alex is the the other game. That was Jeopardy. Uh, but yeah, it's the the Golden Eagles, and that was a a walloping that Miami put on them, uh, which tells me that they're not that great, and it also tells me that uh, Miami needs to schedule teams like that to try to get to uh, some kind of bowl eligibility. But they will visit uh, number six, Ohio State, on 921. That's this Saturday. Chip, what are we going to expect from this game other than to see some backups for Ohio State early in the game? Uh, In the illustrious words of Clubber Lang um, from Rocky Three. 
pain. Um, <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot. I mean, Ohio State, uh, even let's put it let's put it in complete perspective. Miami head coach Chuck Martin said, in comparison to Ohio State, this is almost as though when you go out for recess and you get to pick teams, Ohio State got to make the first 85 picks. I mean, there's nobody on Miami's roster that would come remotely close to starting for Ohio State. So I think Ohio State, all they have to do when we talk about Justin Fields, we talk about J.K. Dobbins, um, get them out of the game, you know, like after the half and play as many of those backups as as much as possible just for the for the good of um, the rest of the team you know just you know you don't want to get those guys hurt uh, in a I don't want to call it meaningless but a, against an overmatched opponent right so chip we talked about master Teague earlier in the program of him getting 106 yards on Saturday the leading rusher for Miami has 108 yards in three games yes uh, but <laughs> you know he does have a touchdown that is a uh, Freshman running back uh, Tyre Shelton. Uh, I'm assuming that's uh, pronounced Tyre. It's T Y R E. Yeah, a, that that sounds about right. Could be a Tyree sounds... situation, but I, I honestly don't know. I haven't seen a single minute or second of Miami football this year, so apologies. Uh, sophomore Davion Johnson uh, has run for 71 yards on 26 carries and has two touchdowns as a team. The Red Hawks have rushed for six touchdowns and allowed five rushing touchdowns. So obviously they are a better rushing team than than the other than their opponents. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering one of those opponents was Iowa, I'm sure that there are Hawkeye fans who would disagree with you. So, all right. So now another quiz for you. All right, Miami freshman quarterback Brett Gabbert, related to or unrelated to Blaine Gabbert. He is related. He is the younger brother of Blaine. All right. You are you are on fire, my friend. Two out of, <laughs> two out of three. <laughs> Blaine Gabbert, uh, 62 attempts, 37 completions. He's completing just under 60. It's just a couple percentage points, uh, tenths of a percentage point, under 60% of his passes. Two touchdowns, one pick, 481 yards total, 160 yards per game. I don't think that's going to get it done. No, it's not. I mean, it, not, I'm sure you've heard the expression, you know, a baptism by fire. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what Mr. Gabbert's going to have when he steps onto the field in Ohio Stadium at 3:30. Uh, he hasn't played. Uh, Iowa has a good defense. Ohio State's showing signs of being a great defense, and he has not faced one nearly as fast and as tough as Ohio State as he will this Saturday. All right, so we've had a little bit of fun. Now, we certainly hope that we haven't jinxed everything. Uh, but Ohio State really has to do a lot wrong rather than Miami doing a lot right, or actually in addition to Miami doing a lot right, to make this a close game. You're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's they're, by and large, I, I know that you weren't too thrilled with seeing uh, the performances of the backups against Indiana, but I can – confidently say that that's pretty much going to be what we will be seeing on Saturday afternoon for most of this game because I think Ohio State should have this comfortably well in, well in hand even before halftime. All right, so now what I need from you is your score prediction. Okay, I'm not going to be so bold as to suggest a shutout. Because that, I mean, I, I want to give Miami some credit. I mean, they did go on the road to Iowa, and they were able to put up, I believe, 14 points against Iowa. Um, and I do know that uh, Ohio State, with backups, I, I know that they're going to still run their offense, but I also believe that they're going to kind of take their foot off the gas a little bit in the second half Um you know, and probably just try to run the ball and, and get out of there without even getting hurt. I'm going to say Ohio State 63, Miami 7. 63 to 7. Okay, very nice. 
I am uh, I'm going to go a little closer than you did again this week, uh, but I am not going to go much closer. Uh, I think that the backups get in early and uh, they still score some points, uh, but I am going to go 54 to 10. Okay. So not too far off. I think we're again we're we're usually you and I are not too far apart on our predictions, and uh, we're either uh, nailing them or we're way off together. <laughs> we we go down and we live and die together i think chip yes yes <laughs> all right so our final bit of business chip will be to uh, select our picks to click so i'm going to give you the floor and let you pick your offensive pick to click okay this is going to be off the beaten path um because last week i had master teague because i felt um that as a backup that he would go over a hundred yards and score a touchdown. And he did both of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go, since we're really going to be talking about backups here, my offensive pick to click is true freshman running back, Marcus Crowley. Wow. A deep pull for chip. All right. My offensive pick to click I think he's going to get some. Uh, I think he's going to get some play early. He's going to get off the field, so his numbers aren't going to be huge as what they might ordinarily be against this opponent. But I think this is a week that we're finally going to see some KJ Hill action. Okay. Uh, he's been used a little bit, but I think this is the week that maybe he comes out, and gets about six or seven catches, a couple touchdowns, and uh, really starts to creep closer to that uh, that all time receptions mark. I like it. Okay, so K.J. Hill is my pick to click. Let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. Now, this is going to be, I think, a difficult thing for us to pick because I expect some backups to get quite a bit of action in this game, and I think you do as well. So I'm going to select first on the defensive side of the ball, and it's, uh, man, it's it's a, it's a tough, tough thing to to think about when you think about all of the talented backups that Ohio State has, but I think what I will do is I am going to pick uh, I'm going to go with Sean Wade this week. Okay. I like it. I think I, he'll like get, it. I think he'll get some play both with the starters and with the backups. I think he'll, he'll play some different positions, and I think he'll get in, uh, in, in both uh, – both the first and second teams. Okay. So I'm going to stick with my backup theme. And this guy, um, he certainly, when he played against Indiana, he had a hit that I know kind of um, brought a hush to the crowd. I'm going to go with linebacker Taraja Mitchell. Okay. Taraja Mitchell. All right. We're locked and loaded for our picks to click. So uh, KJ Hill and Sean Wade for me, Marcus Crowley to Roger Mitchell for you. Mm-hmm. So there we go. All right. We're locked in and we got our predictions. We're ready to roll. We're ready for Saturday. We're ready to play the Miami Red Hawks. Uh, and I mean that literally. Like you and I could play in that game and not hurt Ohio State too badly. Not too badly. Not too badly. They might pick on us, but I think the guys would uh, would rally around us. Yeah, kind of almost like that 1980s movie Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. Chip, uh, do you have anything else you want to discuss before we get out of here? We've talked about the Big Ten. We've talked about Ohio State's game at Indiana. We've talked about Miami. What's left that's on your mind this week? Nothing much. Just my apologies for the technical difficulties, and I'll make extra effort to prevent them in the future. All right, if you want to ask Chip a question, or me, or both of us, uh, please hit us up on Twitter uh, with the hashtag SBPMailbag. That SBP, if you need an explanation, Silver Bullets Podcast. So SBPMailbag is your hashtag to ask us questions. And um, uh, Chip, you can find at on Twitter, at Chip Minnick. And his last name is M-I-N-N-I-C-H, correct? Correct. 
So at Chip Minnick, or you can hit me up at Mike 36 Fan, M I K E 36 F A N, and uh, get us your questions, and we'll read them on the air and answer them on the air. It would be really silly if we just read them on the air and didn't actually answer them. <laughs> Absolutely. Not that we're above doing silly things sometimes. But... No, we're not. We are not. <laughs> uh, Chip, where else can our listeners find you on the internet? They can find me on the Hayes and Cannon section of the Ozone. Um, I usually write the, the three things to watch when it comes to the opponent uh, that Ohio State will be facing, and I'm also a contributor to Athlon Sports. I would like to watch more than three things, Chip, so can you maybe add a fourth thing? Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to be grasping, considering I have a 63-7 to 7 prediction <laughs> out there, trying to find three things that Miami can do that – you know, don't result in, you know, some kind of calamity for the Red Hawks. It's going to be, it's going to be a, a, a chore to kind of find things that Ohio State should truly be concerned about. It might be a good segment. We're looking for exclusive content. We, it might be a good segment for Chip to come in with a fourth thing to watch that he doesn't put in his column. Okay. I'll, I'll give it some thought. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we get out of here, uh, you can find me on uh, – also on the Hazen Cannon section of the Ozone.net, and I write the grumpy old Buckeye uh, pieces every week after the game. They usually land on Sunday morning or Sunday by noon at the latest, usually. And uh, I have to remember, uh, Chip, to to look at my email on Sunday so that I can get in on the the leaves and peeves uh, portion because I've, I'm 0 for three. I haven't to, I haven't contributed to any of them, but. Um, you're you're really going to be I mean I understand you have to find you have to find the negative and and you know like that's the that's your calling with the the grumpy old buckeye but I'm telling you you're really going to be stretching it this Sunday I I can't wait to I can't wait to find you know like it's going to be something about I don't know like somebody's chin strap or their mouth guard or something you know like that you're going to (laughs) find negative yeah I'm gonna it's it's the thing is, though, when it, if you have a game like that and something goes wrong, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So it's easy to, to, to spot for me. Um, where it's harder is in a game where it's a close game back and forth and there's a lot of little things along the way that could have been better. Then, then it's hard because I, can either, I either have to pick and choose or I have to write a whole really long column. Uh, so sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. It's really harder in the second half of those games to find things. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. usually by that time, it's like, well, what am I going to say about this poor kid? It's like his first game, and he's a walk-on, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, it's a fun column to write, and, it's of course, it's tongue-in-cheek. I have, I'm have, convinced that some of the Ozone readers think I'm absolutely seriously mad about some of these things. <laughs> but I'm really not. Well. <laughs> well, I, I, you could talk to Gerd and Tom about you know some of the comments that they get about the articles they write, you know. So I'm sure you know the kind of you know that that expression about misery loves company. Um, yeah. I'm sure you guys could you could commiserate about that. Yeah, a little bit of basketball news, Chip. Uh, the uh, congratulations to Chris Holtman landing top 100 shooting guard Eugene Brown. That was a big get. 2020, right? 2020. Um, I believe that is correct. That is a okay. yes, the the first verbal commitment in the 2020 recruiting class, and uh, that was um, uh, a kid from Georgia. So uh, that was uh, it was good to to go across you know cross country uh, to pull out a shooting <laughs> guard out of uh, you know out of the the great state of Georgia, and uh, you know he had Georgia, Georgia Tech, Louisville. Uh, Texas A&M, Butler, some some you know some decent basketball schools on that list. Yeah, I mean Chris Holtman, he's certainly you know he is. Uh, this is not meant to disparage Thad Mata, but you know he certainly has hit the ground running with uh, his recruiting, um, and I think you know this kind of a commitment you know from a from a kid who was garnering some some very good uh, offers. You know, I, I heard you say Louisville was in there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, traditional power. You know, it's, you know the fact that he was able to get him away from those other other schools, especially being from the South. I think that speaks volumes about Chris Holtman. Sometimes I wonder if you know. Sometimes when you get a kid and you wonder how much of it was the kid wanting playing time, how much of it was a really good recruiting effort, because you know you, you, we saw it this weekend uh, with uh, a player from Ohio who had an Ohio State offer going to Indiana to get playing time. 
And I'm wondering, how much do you rethink that in the wake of 51 to 10? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we were kind of, we were kind of, you know, like going back and forth in terms of just on, on Twitter um, about you said how Pete Werner killed a guy, yeah. um, Cole Guest. <laughs> he did uh, kill him. <laughs> and he plays, yeah, you know, Cole Guest uh, did not, he is not the, the player that, that Michael's referring to. Um, Samson James is, is that young man. But mm-hmm. Cole Guest played for a, a state championship team here at Lakewood St. Edward, and, and I think he, I, I don't have his recruiting profile in front of me, but he was the type that I think, um, you know, predominantly Mac schools and, you know, lower end big 10 schools. And, you know, I think he, I'm sure he probably is thinking, man, you know, you know, being on the receiving end of these beatings for the last three years hasn't been entirely pleasant. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, they got him. Chris Holtman got uh, a good one, uh, you know, a prize recruit. So that's, uh, that's good for Ohio state basketball. And, uh, I am, uh, as being a big Buckeye basketball fan, probably probably a much bigger Buckeye basketball fan than you, Chip. Uh, that's really great news for me. Yeah, well, hey, I, 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 I have a difficult time keeping the football stuff straight. I can't even imagine trying to keep up with all the other things, all the other sports. So. Well, all you have to do is sacrifice your family and a personal life. <laughs> it's not I'll that keep hard. Keep that in mind. <laughs> keep that uh, in mind. All right, that'll do it uh, for this week. Of course, get your questions in for next week, the hashtag SBP Mailbag, and Chip and I will answer your questions. Um, you know, we'll be back to do it next week. We'll, we'll talk about the uh, Miami game. We'll get prepared for that big game against the Cornhuskers. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's until then, you know, we've, 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 we've put to, to bed the discussion of the, the Tom Raper Bowl uh, the the Indiana <laughs> Indiana Ohio border war that was uh, that took place on Saturday, and we look ahead to the Miami Redhawks. So until uh, until that game is played and we reconvene, let's just do the, do the thing that we always do at the end. Go Bucks! Go Bucks! Oh yeah! And by the way, listen to Buckeye Weekly podcast and also the the, the <laughs> Buckeye Sloopcast. There's a little addendum to our show right there for you. Awesome. All right, that's it, everybody. Take care.